This program is brought to you by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu. Okay, so last time we started a, 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 a new concept that was energy conservation. And just like with mass conservation, we use the same rubric, energy in minus energy out equals accumulation plus reaction. So, so energy can be carried in with a process stream. It can be carried out with a process stream. It can accumulate within the process. And through processes of chemical reaction, energy can be consumed or given off. And so the energy balance is the same as the mass balance. And in fact, what we'll find in chemical engineering is that what you learn about in terms of mass transfer carries directly over to energy transfer. And it's one of the unifying themes in chemical engineering, which is also called transport phenomena, transport of mass, transport of energy, and transport of momentum. So one of uh, the really important uh, unit operations that chemical engineers uh, design are heat exchangers. These are devices that allow energy to be exchanged from one moving stream to another moving stream without actually physically mixing the streams together. That's what a heat exchanger does. And from an engineering design point of view, your job, given the parameters of how much energy is to be exchanged, uh, how large should these units be? And what I'll do is give you an insight into the design tools in this lecture and in the one on Wednesday as to how one accomplishes that. But before we do it, we have to, uh, in terms of how large should these be, how much contact area must the heat exchanger be to produce this heat load, we actually did a little bit of a heat exchanger calculation uh, last Wednesday, uh, where we asked what was the heat transfer that was going to be required in order to cool down our high fructose corn syrup process stream using water whose temperature was changing, as I recall, from 15 degrees coming in to a maximum of 30 degrees going out. So we computed how much water would be needed and we computed how much energy was going to be transferred. But to really understand this, you need to understand how heat or energy is transferred and by what mechanisms. And there's basically two that we are going to focus on in this class, and that's conduction and convection. So conduction is the transfer of energy from one medium to another in the absence of any physical motion. So an example would be if I put a pan on the stove and I boil the water inside the pan, I'm transferring heat from the gas flame on the stove through the bottom of the pan to the water. Now, the bottom of the pan clearly isn't moving unless you melt it. So how does the water get hot if it never sees the flame? The metal gets hot. When you say the metal gets hot, how does the water know the metal hot? through vibra vibrational modes. It, this is really an, a, a, an atomic level uh, activity where molecules are excited by the introduction of thermal energy and they want to pass it on. They want to somehow get rid of it. And it gets transferred from wherever the heat source is through this metal barrier into the water. And then the water has to suck up that energy. Now if you keep pumping energy into that water, what does the water finally do? It, it boils. Now, before the water boils, it's just sitting there. And in fact, you know that if you put your oven on, or your gas top on simmer or a low flame, the water might never boil. Now, why is that? So I have energy here going through the bottom of the pan into the water, 
and it, it's keep, it keeps going in, doesn't it? You know, I still have the flame down here, but why doesn't the water boil? You're losing energy out the top. So the water gets warm, but it loses energy out, out the top. And if it can lose energy out the top at a rate commensurate with the energy coming in, it just sits there at steady state. Now, eventually, it, it'll evaporate. And that's, in fact, one way to remove energy, isn't it? Through the process of changing the phase of a liquid to a gas. But if I turn up the gas, then the water boils. So you see that notion of boiling is an additional mechanism of energy transfer by convection. You see, before the water boiled, it was just sitting there. Now when it's boiling, it's, it's moving around. And that's a much more efficient way of transferring the heat from the bottom of the pan to the top and getting rid of it. It's also changing the phase from a liquid to a gas, and that's taking up about 1,100 BTUs per pound of water evaporated. So <clears throat> conduction always happens through a medium. So there has to be a material. Uh, it can be cement, it can be ceramic, it can be metal, it can be plastic. It can also be water. It doesn't have to be a solid. I just gave you an example where you can actually conduct heat through water. It's not boiling, it's just conducting. The water's not in any motion at all. However, if you put the fluid into motion, then you have energy transport by means of what we call convection. So I'll give you an example of that. If I put a block of ice here, a big block of ice, and I tell you that that's the air conditioner, will that block of ice affect the temperature of this room eventually? In principle, if we don't move, we all just sit there and wait for the room to cool down as this block of ice melts. Yeah, eventually, it's not a great air conditioner. But what if I now take the block of ice and I put a fan behind it and I blow air over the fan, big fan, and blow the air over the fan? Do you think that's more efficient means of heat transfer? Because you see, what I'm doing now is I'm actually transferring, if you will, the energy through the bulk motion of the fluid. So I use the bulk motion of the fluid to enhance the rate at which the energy transfer is occurring, as opposed to just letting the little air molecules right next to the ice get kind of cold. And so they stop quivering, and the ones next to them quiver even less and less. And then finally, we get the red, and his, the little molecules on, around his arm start quivering not as much, and he feels a little cool. All right? And so the notion of convection is you need a medium that moves. It can be a liquid, or it can be a gas. Now, you might say, could it be a solid? Yes, I suppose I could pick up the ice and hawk it across the room and call that convection. <laughs> but you know, we just don't think of it that way. All right, so you, uh, and I had a student put that on an exam. I said, what are the, well, how's convection, and what is convection? Oh, you gave this great example of the ice thing, and you just throw it across the room. So I just want to get that out of the way so we don't get that answer again. Uh, now, uh, a car radiator is a good example of where uh, conduction and convection work to transfer energy. So where is the conduction part? From the fluid to the heat exchanger? Through the metal in your radiator from the water, which is circulating through the engine block. And con it's not contacting the air. The air is blowing over the radiator, over the metal part of the radiator, which has fins in it through which the hot fluid is circulating and it's being cooled. Now think about it. The water is now going through the engine block. How did it get hot? The engine is running and creating heat, which heats up the metal through which the water is flowing. So that's conduction. So you have the pistons firing, 
creating a lot of heat. The metal gets hot. You don't want the metal to get too hot. So you have holes in it through which the water is running. It gets hot. It goes out to the radiator. It gets cooled down by the, by the air. And so uh, now there are two types of convection. One is forced and one is natural. When I put the fan behind the ice, was that forced or natural convection? Forced. I had a motor turned on running the fan. Can someone think of an example of natural convection? We hung the block of ice from the ceiling. Hung the block of ice from the ceiling. OK. And tell me what that would do. Uh, cold air is denser. So. It would cool the air. That cool air would fall. And it would start a convection movement in the room in the absence of having a fan or a motor. What's, uh, you had your hand up. What's another example of natural convection? Well, similar, when you just have a radiator, then it'll heat up the air, it goes off, and then... Exactly. So another one, if, um, uh, if you go to Britain, <laughs> And you ask, what's this big metal thing against the wall? They'll tell you that that's the heater. And what do they do? They pump what, water or steam through it? Oil. Or oil, some hot fluid. And the metal gets hot. And what happens to the air around this thing? It gets less dense because it's warmer. So it rises. And as she said, you are? Michelle. Michelle, as Michelle said, the air rises, finally hits the ceiling, moves across, and falls down the other side. If I have radiators on both sides of the room, what do you think the convection pattern looks like? Yeah, it goes up and comes down in the middle. And then if I put radiators here and radiators there, Emerson's in a tornado because it's all coming down right on your head, right? It's coming down everywhere. So. Uh, the idea of natural convection is the flow is induced by a thermal gradient somewhere. That's natural convection. Which do you think is more effective, natural convection or forced convection? OK, I've heard natural, I've heard forced, so let's have a discussion, because those are the only two possible answers. Uh, no one suggested throwing the ice. What? Okay, good point. He said effective or efficient. So if you think of it in terms of energy, I've got to turn on a fan and I've got to use energy to, to do it, but it's more effective. May not be energy wise more efficient. I'm going to be burning some, uh, you know, taking some electrons out of the wall and they got produced somewhere by burning methane somewhere in a power plant. Uh, so typically, if you want to have really effective energy transfer, you use force convection. Uh, but you don't always have to. The new Y2E2 building that was just built in the new uh, engineering quad, if you go in there, you'll see that there's enormous atria in that building with some huge grates at the top. This is all part of a massive natural convection system in that building to cool it or to maintain a thermal stability in the absence of having a huge air conditioning unit, which is why it makes it such a, quote, green building. Now, they tried that with Terman, the building I'm in, uh, where the dean's office is. And that's why the, the, the fountain, the pool is out there. But uh, when that building got older, people forgot why the pool was there. And you, you've probably not been around long enough to know that the Thornton Center wasn't there. And when they built the Thornton Center, they filled in about 30% of the pool because they needed to, to fix it. And right away, the building just turned into a frying pan because they had forgotten that pool was there to cool the air that would then come in those windows down at the, at the bottom of the building and, and uh, cause convection to happen. And, um, so anyway, now we're going to tear the building down. And so. Um, but wasn't that for other reasons? Well, it's really constructive. The uh, oh, the reason of tearing the building down? Yeah. Yeah. Well, the problem is, is they built that building out of wood, and the wood that they built it out of are glue lambs. These are strips of wood that are glued together until you get a beam that's 12 or 17 inches tall and maybe eight inches wide, and that supports the building. But the glue they used was a starch-based glue. 
Oh. Now starch, we know, is composed of monomers of glucose. And now if you're a termite <laughs> looking for a restaurant, <laughs> you come to Termin. <laughs> and you sneak your way through all those little glue lambs chopping your way. So that the only thing holding up that building now are the exoskeletons of all the dead termites. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> and that's a structural form, but it's probably not good enough for <laughs> A long term. So when they get done with the SEQ, uh, the, actually the engineering center, which they just broke ground for about two weeks ago, take about two years to build it, a term and will be vacated and then they will actually just uh, tear it down and that will become open space because of the county use permit that says we can't keep building square footage on this campus. So if we build something like the quad and we take down term and it's kind of like a zero sum game in terms of square footage. So you add add 80,000 square feet and you take away 80,000 square feet. The people at the county understand that 80,000 minus 80,000 is zero. And so we say we haven't done anything. And besides that, this building will be much, quote, greener, much more energy efficient. There's other kinds of, uh, now both of these kinds of heat transfer require a medium, either a moving fluid or a quiescent fluid and a solid through which conduction occurs. There is a form of heat transfer that needs no medium at all. I mean, how do you think we get warm from the sun? Radiation. There's no medium to speak of between the sun and the earth. So it can't be convection or, because it's, there's nothing to move, and it can't be conduction because there's nothing there. So that's radiation. Uh, if you buy these little quartz heaters, uh, that you, uh, you know, you stick down. Most of the energy you're getting from those are, uh, most of that energy is radiation. Although since it's hot, it will heat the air and get some convection, natural convection uh, going. Uh, now here's a concept I want to get across, and it's a concept of flux. And we call it J. And cement this in your mind. A flux of anything is that thing per time per area. In this case, if it's an energy flux, it's the amount of energy passing through a certain area per unit of time. So if I take a flux and multiply it by an area, what are the units? A flux times an area gives me what unit in this case? Energy, energy per time. So remember energy per time is what we were balancing last time? So if I multiply a flux by an area, I will get energy per unit. Uh, likewise, if I take energy per unit time and divide by the area through which that energy is being transported, I will get a flux. We normally work all our problems on fluxes because it takes the area into account. It gives us an answer, which is the amount of energy per area per time. And then if I want to transfer a certain amount of energy per unit time, then I can figure out what the area has to be to transfer that, and that's why we use the term flux. So there's energy fluxes, there's mass fluxes, and there's momentum fluxes. So let's work a simple conduction problem. So I have a slab of material. Uh, this uh, material, I take a little thin slice out of here called dx, uh, uh, infinitesimal thickness. I hold uh, the left-hand wall at x equal to zero at t1 and I hold this right-hand wall at T2, isothermal, where T1 is greater than T2. Now, which way is the energy going to be transferred? Left to right or right to left? T1 is greater than T2. Left to right. By what mechanism will it be transferred? Conduction. This is a solid uh, material. All right? So we can actually describe that mathematically through something known as Fourier's law. Now, Fourier's law is not really a law. It's not like Newton's law, which has its foundations in fundamental physics. This is actually an empirical expression. This is what people have learned is the truth, and no one has disproven it using the, you've read this philosopher Popper who says the only way you can know a theory is true is by falsifying it, and then it's not. Otherwise, it is. 
And because it's very hard to prove things that are true, so you try to falsify things. So in this case, it's that the flux of energy in the x direction is proportional to the temperature gradient across this. That is, the, the rate, if you will, at which temperature drops from T1 to T2. So this is the derivative. Now, who says that? Who says that's right? Why couldn't it be dt dx to the e to the minus 10 power? Or dt dx cubed? Or dt dx to the fourth? Or square root of dt dx? Get a few blocks, test it, see what it looks like. Well, you what? Get a few blocks, try it, see what it looks yeah, like. Yeah, exactly. So through empiricism, through experience, we know that this happens to be true, that the flux is linearly proportional to the temperature gradient. Well, if it's proportional, we can make this proportionality an equality by putting in a proportionality constant, which I've shown here is minus k. k is known as the thermal conductivity. And it's a material property. Every material has a thermal conductivity. Where do you find it? Perry's. So what do you think has a higher thermal conductivity, air or aluminum? Aluminum. How about glass or copper? Copper. copper. So you're getting it. You don't even need Perry's. And so why is there a minus? Yeah, go ahead, uh, Michelle. Temperature decreases, so what is the sign of dt dx? Negative. It's negative. So if dt dx is negative, if I put a negative number in front of this, this becomes a positive quantity. So jx, the flux in the x direction, is positive. So that's just by convention. That's the reason we have a negative. Now the thermal conductivity has units, and these are the units, energy per time, per distance, per foot. How do I know that that's true? How could you check this to be sure that's consistent? Because when I multiply it by dt dx, which is what? Temperature divided by distance? What does this product have units of, If this product here? BTUs per what? Per hour, foot squared. And that's a flux. So you see, that's the right units for thermal conductivity. There's also, you'll learn, fixed law of diffusion. It's another, not another law, but it just simply says that the flux of mass through uh, in, the, in, a, in a direction is directly proportional to the concentration gradient, dc dx. And d is the uh, proportionality constant it's known as the diffusivity. You'll learn about that in some later classes. And Another good one is Ohm's law. That's one you've heard about. Ohm's law says that the flow of current is proportional to the voltage or the voltage difference divided by the resistance. Well, one over the resistance is called what? Conductivity. And so do you make wires out of copper or concrete? I mean, you could make concrete wires. They just wouldn't conduct very well. Um, and so we have lots of examples. So here's some examples of thermal conductivities. Uh, and you'll see that they are temper somewhat temperature dependent. And so you find, look at, at, at copper. So why do you think that you go to the store and you see these aluminum pans, and you know you get to the bottom and they have a copper bottom on them? You ever notice that? Have you ever been in a kitchen? Um, so look at the difference. You, you get about double the thermal conductivity with copper than you do aluminum. And so that's the driving force. Uh, why aren't your pans made out of platinum? Well, first of all, they cost, cost a hell of a lot of money. Um, but it's not, a great, uh, it's not a great conductor. Glass is, is not very good at all. Uh, here's Teflon. And you say, well, gee, they put Teflon on frying pans. That's really stupid. It's really thin. It's really thin. 
All right, it's really thin because the Teflon's there to achieve what? Not conductivity, but slipperiness, right? So you're not scraping your egg off with a chisel, all right? It just slides out. So let's take example of, of heat conduction through a slab. So here's a slab. It's L, has a thickness of L. Let's take a little differential uh, segment through this slab. Here's our temperature T1, hot, temperature T2, cold. And I'll show you, we make a little differential balance. You see, if we make an energy balance along this little slab, this little tiny dx, what urge do you have? What urge? grips you when you see a DX. Integrate, yes. Integrate. That's what you took all that calculus for, to develop that urge to integrate. And so you don't seem to be into it as much as I am. I mean, you know, it's just, it's really cool. And so different urges. Yes, I was right. That's right. I guess I was young once. And so here we have x, and we'll move down the slab dx to x plus dx. And we, so we have energy coming in here of q of x of x, and we have energy leaving here q of x at x plus dx. Now, if I do an energy balance at steady state, and there's no reaction going on inside this little element of dx, and I have no energy source in this little differential element dx, do you see that my balance is input minus output equals zero? No accumulation, no reaction. So q of x at x has to equal q of x at x plus dx. Now that's not true if, for instance, I had a wire running through here and I turned on some power and dissipated some heat into there, then you'd have to take that into account. You'd have an energy source in there. Uh, if I somehow had a, a reaction going on in there that was either producing energy, taking up energy, I'd have to take that into account. So here I don't have that. So Q of X at X equals Q of X at X plus DX for this real simple example through the slab. So where does that first equation come from? What law is this? Whose law is that? Fourier. Fourier's law. Is it really a law? No. It's, it's what we call a phenomenological expression. It comes from life's experience. All right? It's just like Ohm's law. Ohm's law is not a law. It, you know, it could have been that uh, current equals uh, 1 over the resistance times the voltage squared. You know, who says? Just that's, that's the way it worked out. Ohm, I don't know if Ohm, was this Joe Ohm? Was that his name? Does anyone remember? I think it was Joseph. Joseph Ohm. Oh, OK, that's right. I knew it was something like that. So this is Fourier's law. So here we have, let's integrate this. Here we have Q of x, the same Q of x we just balanced. Let's integrate it from 0 to x. So from 0 to some point into our little slab, OK? So we take the dx over. We have the dt over here. We integrate it from t1, which is the temperature of the left-hand slab, to the temperature somewhere x into the slab, t of x. Why did a and k come out of the integral? What assumption did I make? That the area was constant. The thermal conductivity remained constant. So you can integrate this. It's like x dx. So here you get Q of x times x is equal to minus AK times the temperature at the point x minus T1. And so if I solve this for T of x, as I've done here, and Q of x now is my heat transfer rate, uh, uh, energy per unit time, it's a constant. What kind of line is this? T versus x. If I plot t versus x, I get a straight line, all right? And it goes down. So what I've done is I've actually calculated the temperature profile. So the temperature profile in a homogeneous solid is linear. It drops linearly. And if I set x equal to L, which is the other end of my block, and I know the temperature there is T2, I get Q of x is equal to AK over L 
times T1 minus T2. So this gives me the energy transfer rate. And I know that the temperature profile, T of X, is linear. See, so you wouldn't have known that. If I said, what's the temperature profile in the block, you might have said, well, it kind of goes like this, or it goes like this, or whatever. Well, now you know. It's linear. What do you think would happen if I have multiple blocks? Let's say I have glass, steel, and platinum. And I hold the outer walls at constant temperatures, this being higher than this. What would the temperature profile look like? I've got three materials now. So here's our three materials. T1 starts here. T2 starts here. I'm not telling you what the conductivities are, but can you, they're different materials, so. Three lines, three lines of different slopes, exactly. And the slope is determined by the conductivity. So are the slopes greater where the conductivity is highest, as it would be with copper, or is the slope greater where the conductivity is low, like glass? Where do you get the steepest gradients? With low conductivity. All right, think about it. Transfer of heat, Q. For a given conductivity, where do I get the greatest transfer of heat? Where I have a steep gradient or a not so steep gradient? Where is, how do I make Q big? Hold K and A fixed. Is the gradient steep or shallow to make Q big? Q and A are fixed, and they went this big. Do I make this small? <laughs> All right, so we finally got that answer. So dTdx has to be big. So it's real steep. So. Let's put it this way. You got a pan with a copper bottom, and you have a pan with a little concrete bottom, and I put them both on the stove, and I stick my hands in both. <laughs> Which one's going to hurt first? Uh, the copper. The copper, all right? Why? Why is it hurting? Because it's hotter. Right? So it's much more effective at, at conducting the heat. So if I want a really good insulator, do I want to have a steep gradient? No, so basically an insulator is something that allows you to contain energies. You can have a, a real high temperature difference across something. You're not getting much, much heat transfer because K is so Small, all right? So we'll work some problems like that so you can get it. But you really need to get set in your mind what's, you know, what's going on with something, just think of, uh, with a high conductivity or low conductivity uh, with, a, say, a, a similar temperature on, on each side. You know, if I, we, we now know that if I have the metal, it's going to get a lot hotter. So that temperature is going to actually uh, the heat's going to be transferred much more effectively than it will be through concrete. So let's take a look at convection. Now with convection, I can have a solid which, which separates the two fluids, and I can put this fluid in motion, and I can put this fluid in motion. So this fluid is at T hot, this fluid is at T cold. Now, in a solid, we know that the temperature drops T1 to T2 by what kind of line? Straight line. Out here in the moving fluid, it's not a straight line. And in fact, can you imagine that if I really stirred this hot fluid up a whole, whole bunch, where would most of the temperature drop be? 
it'd be right next to the surface, wouldn't it? Because I make this real homogeneous. And so my temperature drop happens real close to the surface. So it's what we call, it's nonlinear. It doesn't drop linearly from T hot out here to T1. It might if this fluid was doing what? It was jello. Wasn't what? It's not moving. Not moving. All right, then it's acting essentially as a quiescent uh, material. There's no fluid motion. It would be approximate linearity. But that's why we mix fluids. And we mix fluids in order to uh, effectively get this surface here as hot as we can, uh, this temperature out here, rather than having the fluid cooling off. So the transport of energy in moving fluids is a challenging problem, and we use an empirical equation. And it's called, it, the equation is Q of x equals H A times T fluid minus T wall. Do you see that this looks a lot like, this is the one we've already seen from conduction, Q of x, is equal to thermal conductivity times the area divided by the length times T1 minus T2. So H in this equation is like what in this equation? K over, K over L. Now K is a material constant you look up in a book and L is something you measure. It's the thickness. When you have a moving fluid out here, H we call the heat transfer coefficient. And H depends on what? What do you think H depends on? The speed, the, the rate at which you're mixing. Good. The density of the fluid. What other thing of the fluid might you think about? The viscosity. The, the heat, capa specific heat, heat capacity. You see, it all comes together. All those things come together to define H. Where do you find H? Paris. Paris, that's where you find H. Yeah, you don't go to Starbucks and ask. You go there, go to Paris. Take Starbucks to Paris. No, take Paris to Starbucks. So, so now we have Q of X being transported to the surface. We have Q of X going through and we have Q of X coming out under conditions of steady state where there's no chemical reaction. So we can write using this empirical equation Q of X on the left hand side is equal to the heat transfer coefficient on the hot side, which has to do with the fluid that's on the hot side, its thermal conductivity, its heat capacity, its density, and its viscosity, and so forth, times the area through which the energy is being transferred, times T hot minus T1. And then you pick up the solid. Well, the solid comes from Fourier's law, QA over L times T1 minus T2. Do you see why you want to make uh, this? really thin, because if you make it thin, L gets really small, and Q gets what? Really big, good. And then coming out the right-hand side is we have H cold, the heat transfer coefficient on the cold side, times the area through which the energy is being transferred, of T2 minus T cold. So it's real simple. This is an empirical equation using heat transfer coefficients that you always use when you have a moving fluid. And you can see how you can combine them with a solid. Because in all heat transfer problems, you have usually two moving fluids separated by a solid. So let's take those three equations, solve them for the temperature differences. So we're just shifting things to the other side of the equation. Now, what temperatures do you think we typically don't know? I mean, you stick a thermometer in, and what are you, what are you measuring? T hot. t hot and T cold. Now, it's not impossible to measure T1 and T2. I could put thermistors or thermocouples on the material. But typically, we don't know those surface temperatures. And so what we can do is if we take these three equations, we can uh, add them together and get this one equation in which T1 and T2 do not appear. So you get T hot minus T cold is equal to QX over A times this stuff in parentheses. We're solving for QX, the heat flow, energy per unit time. You get one over this times A times T hot minus T cold. Uh, look at that last equation on the previous page. This has the same form, doesn't it? 
as H times A times T hot minus T cold, right? Except now you've got this sum of these reciprocals. We call this multiplier out here in front the overall heat transfer coefficient big U. Where do you find big U? Paris, of course. So big U is simply 1 over the sum of the reciprocals of the heat transfer coefficient on the hot side, cold side, and L over K. So now you can rewrite this equation as Q of X is equal to U times A times T hot minus T cold. Doesn't that look just like the equations we had on the previous page, how we've put it in? The point is, is that to generate any kind of heat flow, it's going to be directly related to the size of big U, the size of the area through which the energy is flowing, and the temperature difference that's driving it. And this is called a force flux equation. If I divide through by A, QX over A is called a what? Flux. The flux I get is directly proportional to the driving force. What's the driving force for the flux? T hot minus T cold, the temperature difference. All right? And what modulates it? What modulates how much heat I'm getting through for a given temperature difference? Big U. And big U consists of three terms. Okay? Now, can you see that if H hot, let's say H hot was really big, a really good high heat transfer coefficient, and H cold was really big, a really good heat transfer coefficient. If they get big enough, what do these terms become? They approach a real small number. And so what would be the thing that really governs heat transfer in that system? What controls? This, the metal or the solid controls. You will always find in any of these problems that there's going to be a controlling element to the transfer of energy. It can be the fluid on the hot side, it can be the fluid on the cold side, or it can be the material in the middle that separates the two. We call that the rate controller. Now you can have situations where all three of these numbers could be exactly the same. And they all offer the same resistance. So you see I'm talking about resistance to heat transfer. Well, what equation are you used to thinking about resistance? Whose law? Ohm's. Ohm's law. So look at Ohm's law. This is why you took, this is why you took three quarters of physics to get this. Because Ohm's law says that the current is equal to the voltage divided by the sum of the resistances when I have resistances in series. So compare it to this. Here's our equation. Q of x is equal to delta t, and I brought the a's under, the a in here. That's the equation we had. So that's, this is the energy flow, this is the current flow, is equal to delta t divided by the sum of the thermal resistances. So do you see that these things lining up are just like the resistances in Ohm's equation? So this is a resistance to heat transfer, this is a resistance, and this is a resistance. You add them all up and you get the sum of the thermal resistances. If I were to give you a problem and say, what percent of the thermal resistance to heat transfer in this problem is given by the barrier separating them? How would you solve that problem? You'd, you'd figure out this number, you'd figure out that number, you'd figure out that number, you'd add them together, and you'd divide them into that number, and that would give you the resistance of that element. And so you can always figure out where the resistance is. And why would you want to do that as an engineer? Okay, I found the resistance is, is on the hot side. What would I do as an engineer? I'd change that. How might I change it on the hot side? What would be a real simple thing to do? Stir more. Stir more. Well, let's say I've got a 5,000 horsepower mixer already over there. You might change what? The fluid. Because see, I was using silly putty. <laughs> and I had, a, I had a degree from Lower Slobovia State. And now I ran into a guy from Stanford, you know, person taking E20. He said, oh, take out the silly putty. Don't use that. You know, use a good heat transfer fluid, like a really refined oil. And lo and behold, 
This becomes the biggest resistance. Then what would you do? Make it thinner or change the material that would have a what? Higher or lower thermal conductivity? Higher. Do you see how that works? So Ohm's law is a good way to think about this. But one of the things that you need to come away with is that the flux that you get of energy is directly proportional to a driving force, which is a temperature difference. So the flux of current you get is directly related to a voltage difference. The flux of mass that you get is related to a concentration difference. See how all these start to fall into place now? So Ohm's law, Fourier's law, and Fick's law are all sort of uh, experiential equations. Uh, they tend to work because no one has been able to find things where they don't work. Now, you can have thermal conductivities that vary in direction. Why is wood a good example? The grain. Heat transfer along the grain is different than heat transfer across the grain because it's an asymmetric material. So you can have composites and other materials that have thermal conductivities that are different in the different directions. That's one thing to look out for. OK, so what we'll do next time is we'll actually design a heat exchanger. That's pretty cool. The preceding program is copyrighted by Stanford University. Please visit us at stanford.edu.